Okay, we'll turn over to Acts chapter 16. And so we are in this chapter in Acts, and we've been here a while in Acts chapter 16. I know we spent a long time in Acts chapter 15, but these are just great, great chapters, not only in the Bible, but especially in the book of Acts. And they're so impactful, not only to what happened then, but really where we are even today, because especially this middle part of the book of Acts, a lot of the things we do missionally and a lot of the ways we share the gospel come out of this, and we still practice the things. The Apostle Paul and Barnabas started out leaving the church of Antioch as they went on their first mission journey, and so we saw that in Acts chapter 13, and then kind of leading on now to Acts chapter 16, where Paul is going on his second missionary journey. Now, of course, in Him and Barnabas are no longer together. We read about that in Acts chapter 15 towards the end. They have separated, and Barnabas goes on a different missionary trek, and he goes with John Mark, and now Paul is going a different direction, and he is going with a young man named Timothy, a man named Silas, and also traveling with him is Luke, who writes the book of Acts. And so Luke is seeing firsthand what's happening. So what you're reading in the book of Acts is a firsthand account of what happens to Paul on his missionary journey. So again, this is his second missionary journey, and if you remember, he was trying to go at the beginning of Acts chapter 16 to basically Asia Minor. That's where he wanted to go over towards Turkey, even going on up to to India. And probably the reason he wanted to go there is because that's kind of where he's from. I mean, that's basically Asia Minor is where Paul grew up. Tarsus is where he grew up. That's where Asia Minor is in that area. So that's probably why he wanted to go there. But we saw in Acts chapter 16 that the Holy Spirit of God stopped him. Two different times he tried to keep going the way he wanted to go. The Holy Spirit stopped him and then called him to a place called Macedonia. And that's basically Greece today. And so Paul took the gospel of Jesus Christ to Greece. And there he met in Philippi a lady named Lydia. And Lydia is actually from the place Paul wanted to go to begin with. But Lydia was a very wealthy woman, businesswoman, and she was in Philippi for business. And so she was there and she was saved. God grabbed her and reached her with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we know eventually the gospel through her gets back to where Paul wanted to go in the first place. So God just had a different plan and a different way for it to work. And so the Apostle Paul now is in Philippi because the Holy Spirit called him there through a vision, and he's ministering there. And so now I want you to see just an incredible story of what happens as Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke are ministering in Philippi. So we'll look down at verse 16. We'll start here today. And this is what the Bible says here. Luke writes this. He says, One day as we... Now, that's one of the ways you know Luke is standing here because we know he wrote the book of Acts, so he's telling you what happened to us. He says we. He uses that pronoun there. So one day as we were going down to the place of prayer, now remember we talked about this last week, this is the river, that's where this is, because in Philippi they don't have a synagogue building per se, but the word synagogue just means gathering place. And so we look back from the book of Psalms and others, and I tried to tell you that if there weren't enough people to actually have a building, enough Jews to have a synagogue building, they would meet always by a river. That's where they would meet. That's where they would worship. That's where they would hold service, basically. So that's where they're going. They're going down to the river, the place of prayer. And as they were going to the river, we met a slave girl who had a spirit that enabled her to tell the future. She earned a lot of money for her masters by telling fortunes. Okay, there's a lot here just in this one verse, but one thing you see is she didn't just have one master. She had masters plural, okay? So she was a slave, but she was owned by more than one person. Now, that's interesting. We don't think about it like that, right? We think about if you're a slave, you have one master, you have one owner. But obviously, businessmen would go in, especially a slave girl like this, who they thought they could make a lot of money on, and they would invest in her from multiple people. And so that's what's happened. So three, four, five, we don't know how many masters she had, how many slave owners she had, but they pooled their money together, they bought her, and they bought her because she could make them money. And the way she made them money is by telling fortunes because she had a demon. She was demon-possessed. She had a spirit. That's what she was. Okay? Now, I... asked you this last week, but please understand this. 
I mean, she would tell fortunes and she would tell the future, but could she really tell your future? No, because demons, even Satan, they're not omniscient, okay? They're definitely not providential. The word providential, it's a Latin word, but all that word means is to see ahead or to see before it happens. Now, God is providential. We know that biblically. God can see ahead. Satan can't see ahead. But here's what Satan and demons can do. They can be very perceptive, very perceptive, and they are very wise, very wise. And they know, do know the future in certain aspects because one of the things they can do, just like you and I can do, is they can read the Bible. Okay, does the Bible tell us about our future? Yeah. Well, of course it does, all the time. And that's one of the things we study in the book of Revelation so long, okay? So they can know exactly what you know about the future from a biblical perspective, from a God's kingdom perspective. They can know that. And then they can also know perceptionally pretty much everything you do and everything you're going to do. Now let's think about that for a moment. How many of you in here have habits? <laughs> yeah, you do, right? And how many of you do the same thing over and over and over again. Okay, I'm going to tell a fortune right now because Sunday morning I'm going to tell you where you're going to sit when you go in that church. <laughs> I can do that. Okay, does that mean I can tell the future? No, I just know your sorry butt's going to be in the same place you were last week, right? I know that. Okay, so that's how this works. I mean, it's not magic here. I mean, this demonic spirit that is in this little girl is just being wise and perceptive. And so to tell someone's future, you're just telling them what they're going to do. And a demon knows that just by being perceptive. And here's also what a fortune teller does, if you really want to know what a fortune teller does. All they do is tell you what you want to hear. They tell you what you want to hear, and then what are you going to do? That's right. <laughs> Every time. They really do know the future because it's what you want to hear. It's what you want to have happen, right? So that's how she makes money. And she makes a lot of money. Because they have hopes of great wealth. You're going to see that in just a minute. Okay? So just so you know that. Keep going. Verse 17. This is what she did, this little demon-possessed girl. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God, and they have come to tell you how to be saved. Now, this one boggles my mind in all honesty. Because it's not this girl saying this. Who's saying this? Now, here's my question. Why in the world would this demon be shouting to the crowds and the masses exactly what Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke are trying to do? Why would... I don't understand this. I really don't. But look at how they did it. Verse 18. This went on day after day. Day after day. Yeah, Ma. Disinformation. Disinformation. But it really wasn't disinformation. No, but it divides the view of you have one person that has one path so that everyone agrees upon mm -hmm. and being able to tell things even though it's coming from the devil. And over here you have a God-centered uh, girl. And so she is just trying to divide the crowd. Yeah. And it probably is division. But it's still truth. I mean, here's the thing, like, okay, if you say, like, propaganda, what propaganda is. Propaganda has truth in it, but it basically flips the truth on its head. Okay, that's what propaganda does. Okay, so you can see propaganda all the time during our day, because here's how propaganda works. Okay, basically propaganda works like this. I'm doing something that I shouldn't do. But rather than taking ownership of that, all I do is simply claim you're doing it. And I flip the truth on its head. Does that make sense? You were stating that we're telling, they're telling you what you do all the time. Well, they probably seen the calling and going around and telling this. Oh, yeah. They were hearing it. Well, I mean, they're telling the truth. Yes, I know. But, you know, it's like they were backing it up like you say, you know, like. Well, they are, but it's just, what's amazing to me, there's no lie here. No. There's no lie. There's no propaganda. This is sheer truth, and they're telling people how to be saved. 
Now, this is what's going to be interesting. I want you to hold on to that word save because that's going to become important in just a few minutes. Not right now, but in just a minute, that's going to become important. Really important. But it basically, this little girl is Paul and Silas's advertisement. She's their megaphone. She's their social media person. She's going before them telling people what they're going to do. And so she's advertising for them. And so were people being saved in Philippi? Yeah, we know that because we have a church in Philippi, right? We have a letter later to the church, the Philippian letter. That's what we have. And so all she's doing is speaking truth here. But I don't know why the demon's doing it. But this is what happens, verse 18. This went on day after day until Paul got exasperated. Now, we don't know how many days it went on. It could be weeks. It could be a few days. We don't know. But I guess the question is, why did he finally get exasperated? At first, he wasn't exasperated. At first, he probably liked it because it was probably helping his ministry and helping his cause. But maybe he just got tired of this little girl following him around. I don't know. Maybe he got tired of the noise. Who knows? But finally, he got sick of it, and this is what happened. He turned, and he said to the demon, not to the girl, he said to the demon within her, I command you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to come out of her, and instantly it left her. Now, those words, I mean, just think about those words. Instantly it left her. Why? Because it was commanded in the name of Jesus. And we can talk a lot about demon possession, but there's more to this story, so let's just keep going. Look at what it says in verse 19. Again, it's her master's, so multiple. Her master's hopes of wealth were now shattered. So they grabbed Paul and Silas. Now, who didn't they grab? Luke and Timothy, they didn't. It's they only grabbed Paul and Silas. Now, we don't know why. We don't probably, I'm assuming, is because Timothy, we know, is a teenager at this point. And so what's about to happen to Paul and Silas is why his mom probably didn't want him to go on this missionary journey in the first place. But he's probably just kind of like an intern. So he's not participating. He's watching and he's learning. So he's learning from his mentors. And Luke, we know, is just there to record everything. So they're probably standing back watching this, and they're watching what's about to happen. So they grab Paul and Silas, and they drag them before the authorities at the marketplace. Okay, verse 20. The whole city is in a uproar because of these Jews. They shouted at the city officials. Okay, just a couple of things here. Remember where they are. This is different than being like in Jerusalem because the Bible says earlier in Acts chapter 16 that Philippi is a Roman colony. Okay, it's a colony. So basically, this is Rome, basically. This is just like being in Rome. Okay, this is not a province. This is not an outpost. This is not just a place where a few soldiers are mingling around to keep the peace and to make sure everybody knows this is part of the Roman Empire. This is a colony. So this is Rome under Rome rule, Rome authority, Rome culture, everything. It's Rome. Okay, so there are city officials and there are Romans there. And one of the things that's very specific here is it says, because of these Jews... Now, even in Roman times, there was prejudice against Jewish people. And so you can see that a lot in the life of Jesus and the way that some of the Romans dealt with him and all through Roman history. There is a prejudice against Jews. So that was part of their accusations. Not are these people just causing a ruckus. Not did they just take my hopes of wealth away. They're Jews. Okay? Now, here's the thing. Were they really Jews in a sense of what they were doing? No. Okay, they're there as followers of Christ, right? Now, they're Jewish by heritage. They're Jewish by birth, but they're Christian. Okay, they're there for the sake of the gospel. Now, that's about to become very apparent. Look at what it says, verse 21. They are teaching customs that are illegal for us as Romans to practice. Okay. Now let's talk about this because this is important and this is going to be important the rest of the book of Acts. 
Okay, what is illegal about what Paul and Silas are teaching that's illegal for a Roman to practice? Yeah, one God. It, it all has to do with authority and worship. Okay? So Paul and Silas, what they're teaching is they're teaching Jesus. And Jesus is what this little girl says. They're telling you how to be saved. Well, how can you be saved? Only through Jesus. And who can you worship after you come to Jesus Christ? Only Jesus. You don't bow down to any more lords. You don't bow down to Caesar. You do not worship him. You do not call him Lord. Because in this day, that's what they called Caesar. That's what they called the king of the Roman Empire. They bowed down and they worshiped. They were commanded every year to do this. That was one of their duties as a Roman citizen. At some point in the year, before an authority, they knelt down and they cried out that Caesar is Lord. And so Paul and Silas are teaching, guys, no one is your Lord except Jesus Christ. He is the only one who saves, and you follow him. Now, if they had come into Philippi and said, hey, guys, Jesus Christ is the best way, and Jesus Christ is a way that you can get to God in heaven, and if you will worship him and allow him to be one of your gods, none of this would have mattered because they worship bazillions of gods. I mean, bazillions of them. And you can go look at Greek mythology. You can see this through that. Okay, so worshiping God wasn't the issue. It was the exclusivity of worshiping one God and only one God and calling him King Jesus. Okay? So what you're going to have right here, beginning in the rest of the book of Acts, even to the day in which we live 2,000 years later, is you have kingdoms coming into conflict. Okay, so what kingdom is coming into conflict right before your eyes here in Acts chapter 16? Well, you have the kingdom of God, and then you have the Roman kingdom coming into conflict. But that's kind of a secondary issue, in all honesty. Because really, the kingdom coming into conflict and the kingdom the Roman Empire basically is a metaphor for is the kingdom of darkness. Okay? So in this world, even to this day, right now, we have two kingdoms, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness. And you have two rulers over those kingdoms, right? The kingdom of God is ruled by who? King Jesus. Okay, that's who rules it. Who's coming back as king? Well, go read Revelation. Okay, he's coming back on a white horse. And how's he coming? With a crown on his brow, right? A crown of glory. And he's coming with something written on his thigh. What is it? The King of kings and the Lord of lords. It is his kingdom. And so he is the ruler of the kingdom of God, Jesus Christ. And one day, guess what? As heirs of that kingdom, what are you going to do? You're going to rule with him. Okay? You're a part of that kingdom. You're going to rule with him. But right here, we have kingdoms coming into conflict, coming into war with one another. And here's a great question for you. If you remember, we started Acts a long time ago. But what is the book of Acts about? Okay, it's about the acts of the Holy Spirit, but what is the Holy Spirit doing in the book of Acts? He is working for what? The kingdom of God. Okay, at the very beginning of Acts 1, when Jesus Christ is here for 40 days and 40 nights, he does one thing. He teaches his disciples about what? Go read verse 4. Somebody go read Acts 1-4. He teaches them only about one thing. Yeah, what is it? Is it verse 3? It might be verse 3. It is. It's verse 3. To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Okay. So for 40 days and 40 nights, what did Jesus Christ do on this earth? Okay. Prove to them that he's alive, and he taught them about the kingdom of God, right? That's what he taught them about. Okay, just listen to this. This is the end of the book of Acts. Okay, this is what it says. For the next two years, Paul lived in Rome at his own expense, meaning he's in prison, okay? He's in jail. And when you were in jail in Rome, if you wanted to eat, you had to pay for it. They didn't do what we do today in America, okay? So that he's in jail. Okay, so he's in Rome at his own expense. He welcomed all who visited him, and this is what he did, boldly proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ 
and no one tried to stop him. So what is the book of Acts? The beginning and the end. It's about what? The kingdom of God. And what's everything in between? The kingdom of God and God advancing his kingdom on this earth. And who does he use to do that? You and me, his disciples. What's he using right here in Acts chapter 16? His disciples. He is using Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke to advance the kingdom of God. Okay, now let's clear some things up here because this is important. Because right now on this earth... We know there is a ruler of this world. And who is that? It's not Jesus. It's Satan. Satan is the ruler of this world in which we live right now. So he's king of it, right? If he's ruler, he's king. Yeah? Okay, so he is king of this world right now. That's who he is. Okay, so here's a great question. How can he be king and how can Jesus be king? Because there's two kingdoms at war. Two kingdoms in conflict. And where do we live right now? We live in this world. So who's the ruler of the world in which we live? Satan. He's the ruler of the world in which we live. Now, is he our ruler as followers of Jesus Christ? Who's our ruler? King Jesus. So do we have a conflict? Is it not exactly what was happening here in Acts chapter 16 in a physical sense? This is what's happening to us in a spiritual sense. We are under the authority of the kingdom of God. We worship and rule and call Jesus Christ Lord. But do we live where he lives? No, we live in a land where we're foreigners. We're aliens, right? Okay. And so we got some conflict. And we're going to have trouble. Yeah? Is Paul and Silas about to have trouble? Yeah, they're about to have trouble. Because let's talk about kingdoms a minute. Because this... Biblically, not just Acts. Biblically, this is important. Okay, one thing you got to understand about kingdoms. There is only one kingdom that matters, especially from a universal sense. And that is the kingdom of God. Because it is the only eternal kingdom there is. And it is a universal kingdom, meaning it's over everything. Okay, is Satan's kingdom universal? What's he got of? This world. Now, I know we think this world's pretty big. This world ain't very big when it concerns God. He's universal, right? We're just a small little snippet in his universe. Okay? We saw that during COVID. But, I mean, we're a small snippet in this universe, right? Okay, so Satan is here. But what you've got to remember, and this is hard for us, but God's kingdom's eternal. Is Satan's kingdom eternal? It's temporal, right? What's going to happen at the end of Satan's reign? He's going to be thrown into a place made from him when? At the foundations of what? This world. Not God's kingdom, but this world, right? Okay? So why is this kingdom that we're living in right now temporal and God's kingdom eternal? Because guess what? Every person in this room is an eternal being because you're made in the image of God. You're just like him. You're made like him. You're eternal. Okay, so when we were created, were we created for this world, for a temporal world that is ruled by a different king? No, we were created to live with God and to live with him how long? Forever and ever and ever and ever. And in the Garden of Eden, we were eternal because we were with God. So what happened? Sin happened. Okay, and when we sinned, God did something out of grace, and this is grace. He set up time. You realize before the sin, was there time? There was eternity. So I guess in a sense there was time, eternal time, but not in our sense of time, not in a timeline, a beginning and an end. There was nothing. We were eternal beings. We still are, but now we've been placed in a temporal world. Okay, The reason God set up time is to give us an opportunity to be saved. One of the things we know, God is holy, right? That means set apart from sin. Okay, so in the garden, when we were eternal with God and we sinned, God had to be separated from us. And so if he had left us eternal beings in the garden there, what would have been reality for us? We would have lived in hell forever because we would have been separated from God forever. 
So what did he do? He kicked us out. And what did he establish? Time. Temporary. And in that temporary, now we have an opportunity to be saved and to return to him. Right? And that's where we're living right now. In a temporal world. But guess what's going to happen that always happens with time? There's always a beginning of time and there's always an end of time, right? Your life. Pretty good example. You have a beginning, you have an end. You have a birth, you have a death. Same thing with this world. Okay? So this world is going to end. The temporal is going to end. But what has God been doing for thousands and thousands of years? 2 Peter 3, 9. He has been patient. Why? Because He doesn't want anyone to be destroyed, but everyone to come to repentance. He is being patient. Now, what does it say just before that? In God's time, a day is like... A thousand years? A thousand years like a day. Because time don't matter to God. He ain't bound by time. He's eternal. This world that we live, this kingdom we're in right now is temporal. And that's why you have one chance and only one chance to come to God through salvation. That's why Paul was telling people how to be saved and this little slave girl was announcing it even before he did it. And so you have a chance to be saved. And then after that time runs out, it's too late. And God has been patient, waiting to send Jesus Christ back because he's been patient about a promise, and the promise is the return of the king. But one day the king is going to return, and when he returns, guess what? It's over. It's too late. And there will no longer be two kingdoms. How many kingdoms will there be? One, the kingdom of God eternally. Okay, so I want you to get that because you're going to see kingdom and conflict the rest of the book of Acts. And I want you to understand what's happening. You're seeing it in a physical sense, but this is just a metaphor for a spiritual reality. You just see it in the physical, and you're seeing it right here in Acts chapter 16. So I just wanted to try to get that clear. Okay, look at verse 22. This is what happens next to Paul and Silas. The Bible says there, A mob formed quickly against Paul and Silas. Now, isn't that how a mob works? Yeah, mobs can form pretty quickly, right? And they can be pretty fickle. And so this is what the city officials did when the mob formed. They ordered them stripped and beaten with wood rods. Now, I want you to think, as we read this, I want you to think back to Jesus Christ and the crucifixion. And I want you to see the similarities here, okay? This is what it says next. They were severely beaten, and then they were thrown into prison. Okay, the word there is the same word for flogging, but what flogging literally means is to lay stripes on one's back. Okay? So that's what it means to be severely beaten. So think about Jesus when he was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, and then he's tried all those things three trials at night. Then they eventually get him to Pontius Pilate the next day in the praetorium in the middle of Jerusalem, close to the temple. What did Pilate do when a mob formed, a crowd formed? And what were they shouting? Crucify, crucify. What did Pilate order for have happened to Jesus? He ordered him to be flogged, to have lashes or stripes put across his back. Why? Because he thought that would appease the crowd once they saw him after they beat him to death, basically. And he thought they would be able to let him go at that point. That's why Pilate did that. So the city officials here, what are they trying to do? Appease the mob. That's all they're trying to do. They're trying to appease them. And just look, they do the same thing to Paul and Silas they did to Jesus. In that praetorium, what would have been the first thing they would have done to Jesus before they beat him? They would have stripped him. He would have been stripped. Now, why do they strip you? Because they don't want anything in between that beating and your back. And so that's what they do to Paul and Silas. Now, the difference here, and it says it specifically here, we know that Jesus was not beaten with a rod. We know that he was beaten with basically a flagellum or a cat of nine tails, whatever you want to call it, but as a whip with bone and lead bit in it. So that's how Jesus was beaten. Here, they're just beaten with rods. Now, when it says rod here, I want you to think of something uh, 
kind of like something in between a broomstick handle and a baseball bat. It would have been something kind of in between that. It would have been pliable enough to bend, so it would have a whipping type action, and it would have been hard, and it would have hurt. Anybody ever been hit with a baseball bat across the back? It hurts, I'm telling you. Uh, it hurts bad anywhere you get hit with a baseball bat. But uh, we have no idea how many lashes they got, how many stripes were laid on their back. We just know that they were severely beaten. That's how the Bible describes it, severely, <coughs> severely. So that's what happens because all they were doing is sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it came into conflict with what the people believed. And it's the same thing that happens today. So after they were beaten, the Bible says they were thrown into prison. And then the Bible says the jailer was ordered to make sure they did not escape. Okay, the jailer here would have been a Roman officer. Probably a high-ranking Roman officer, because probably what would have happened, this is kind of your last stage in life as an officer, a soldier in the Roman. This is kind of that cush job. You don't have to go off to fight anymore. You don't have to do a lot of just hard labor in the streets, keeping control. You just watch the prison. So he's probably a high-ranking Roman officer, and he's in charge of the jail. And what can you not let happen in the jail? We saw this earlier in the book of Acts. You better not let anybody escape from that jail because if you let somebody escape from that jail, not only do you lose your job, it could be a corporal offense in the Roman world. They'll kill you. Okay, they'll kill you for it. So your job, you better do it well. Okay, no free passes there. So because of that, this is what the jailer does. He put them into the inner dungeon and clamped their feet into stocks. <coughs> Okay, the inner dungeon, this would just basically be like solitary, I guess. So he put Paul and Silas in solitary confinement. Not only did he put them in solitary, he locked them there. He put them in stocks, chains, where there was no way that they could escape. Now remember, this is night. We know that because it's about to say after midnight, this is dark. They're there, and they probably can't see the hand in front of their face, much less anything that is happening around them or each other. They can't see anything. They have been beaten severely, so they have lashes, and they have bruises, and they have cuts, and they are in tremendous, tremendous pain, tremendous pain. They have to be. Not just physical here, but, I mean, probably emotional, probably spiritual. Think they ever asked the question, why God? I mean, God, we're trying to do what you told us to do. Why are we here now? I would have asked that question. Maybe you're better than me, but I would have probably asked that question. But this is what we know, and we don't know how long they sat in prison after the beating until this verse, verse 25, but this is what they did. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. Now, there's a lot in that verse. But around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns. Now think about that for a moment. This wasn't a time in their life when everything was roses and there was money in the bank and food in the cupboard and everything was going great. This is at a low point in their life. And what do they choose to do? They choose to sing and to worship. Now we don't know exactly why they do this. I mean, we can rationalize, but I just want you to think about the Apostle Paul for a minute and think about full circle how this has come. Where did we first meet the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts? What was he doing? He was doing the same thing that he had just happened to him, right? He was throwing Christians into prison. And now it's come full circle and he is thrown into prison. And he might want to get real comfortable with this place. Because he's going to see it a lot the rest of his life. He's going to be in prison more than he's free the rest of his life from this point on. This is his first time in prison, and he's going to be there a while. And so he better get used to it because it's going to become his life. But even in the midst of the darkness, not only physical but spiritual, him and Silas pray, and not only pray, they sing. They praise God. 
Now, two great points here. Does anybody in here ever struggle sleeping? Do y'all struggle with sleep? A lot of times I'll wake up in the middle of the night, and you know what inevitably always happens when I'm awakened in the middle of the night? That's when God wants me to pray. I mean, it's just when he wants me to pray, and he'll always put somebody on my heart almost immediately when I wake up, and that's when I pray. I don't know what it is about praying in the middle of the night when there are no distraction, when there's no noise, when there's no nothing but darkness, but God will meet with you. And so if you're having trouble sleeping or you wake up in the middle of the night, good thing to do is to pray and to praise. And here's the second thing I want you to understand here. And I say this all the time about prayer. You cannot separate prayer and worship. You cannot separate them. They go hand in hand. They're the same thing. I know that the way we've been taught to pray all our life and the way we think about prayer, we separate the two, right? We think worship has its place here and we think prayer has its place here. That's not the way it works. They go hand in hand. And I'm telling you, when you pray, you ought to worship. And when you worship, you ought to pray. Now, why do I say that? Okay, well, here's a great question. How do you enter into God's presence? Do what? Humble, humility, yes, definitely humility. What else? Yeah. Here to listen. Listen to Psalm 100. Psalm 100, shout with joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with singing and with joy. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us and we are his. We are his sheep and of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Where is God from a sense? I mean, you enter into a gate, but does that take you into the house? No, that's how you get to the first place. Then where do you go? You go on internal. You go inside. So you get into the courts with what? Praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his unfailing love continues forever. So you enter in the presence of God, how? Through praise, through worship. That's how you enter into his courts. That's how you get into the inner sanctum where God is. And then what do you do when you're there? You pray. You're in his presence. You pray. You talk to him. That's what you do. That's what prayer is. You talk to God. You just talk to him. And so that's what Paul and Silas are doing. In a dark dungeon, they have entered into the courts of God through prayer and praise. And what are all the prisoners doing around them? Listening to them. Now think about that for a minute. In the middle of prison, all these hardened criminals in jail for who knows what are listening to the prayer and the praises of God's people. What do you think the world out there is going to listen to? They listen to prayer and praise because it amazes them. And do you know when it amazes them? When you're at your lowest point. Okay, it's easy for me to praise God when I ain't got no trouble. Right? I can do that all day long. It ain't so easy when you got lashes across your back and you're in chains and in prison when you lost your job or when your marriage is caving in or when your children are prodigals. I mean, on and on. We can talk about problems all day, right? Because we all got them. When do you think the world is listening to you? When do you think the world is watching you? That's when they're watching. That's when you have an opportunity with the gospel of Jesus Christ because it simply amazes them that even in the midst of what you're going through, whatever it is, that you can take time to pray and praise Him? How in the world can you praise Him when you're going through this? Blows their stinking mind. But do you know what they want? They want what you got, the joy and the peace. And whatever that is, we call salvation because they don't understand it because it ain't nothing like this world. And they're drawn to it. And every prisoner in that prison was listening. They were listening. And this is what happens next. 
as they were singing hymns to God and the prisoners were listening, suddenly there was a massive earthquake. Now, this is interesting. It says, what type of earthquake? Massive. But where was the earthquake contained? Just in this prison. Nowhere else in the city was affected. It ain't like Morocco, where 40, 50, 60 miles of area was decimated by an earthquake a couple weeks ago. This was isolated to one little prison, and the whole city was fine, and everybody else stayed asleep. So a massive earthquake hit this prison, and the prison was shaken to its foundations, and all the doors immediately flew open, and the chains of every prisoner fell off. Okay. What happens when we pray and when we praise God? And this is, again, this is a spiritual reality that you see in a physical world right here. What happens when we pray and when we praise? Chains fall off. Bondage, things that bind us and hold us, they're gone. Why do you think we do what we did Sunday and have James 5 services? Because of this, we want chains to be gone, and we want people to be set free, and we want God to move. What moves Him? Prayer and praise. When we cry out to Him, that's what moves Him. And every chain, not just of Paul and Silas, but who? Every prisoner in that place fell off. Did God move in their lives? Well, heck yeah, He did. They were listening, and then He moved. And how do I know He moved? Well, look, keep looking. Verse 27. The jailer woke up to see the prison door. Yeah. Before you leave from that. Yes, sir. Uh, the Holy Spirit does not actually need our help. Well, of course he doesn't. But when we are in worship in spirit, he welcomes that to intervene with us. Well, he, inter he, interve he not only intervenes, he enters in with us. When you intervene with him, yep. action. Of course. We talked about that Sunday in Mark chapter 4. When we cry out, it's what moves God. And that's what he did. So verse 27, the jailer woke up to see the prison doors were wide open. His house was probably attached to the prison. That's where he lived. And so he woke up and he saw the prison doors were open. So he assumed the prisoners had escaped. Probably a good assumption, right? So he drew his sword to kill himself. Now why is he going to kill himself? Because he's going to die anyway. I mean, it's corporal punishment. He didn't do his job. He's about to die, so he's just going to take care of it himself. But verse 28, Paul shouted at him, Stop. Don't kill yourself. Because who are here? Okay, he's not just talking about Paul and Silas. Who all's there? All the prisoners. Now think about prisoners for a second. Now, if you're in a prison, what's your number one goal? Get out of that sucker, right? I mean, number one, number uno goal, get out of there. Okay, my chains just fell off and the door's wide open. What I'm probably thinking, well, it's a good chance. But they didn't leave. They didn't leave. Why didn't they leave? Because they just met with God. Now, I don't know that they met God, but they met with God. And it obviously has changed some things in their life, some priorities. And they're all there, every one of them. Paul says it. We're all here. The jailer called for lights. Now, remember, they don't have electricity. He doesn't flip a switch. It's not how it works. <laughs> he has to get torches, and they have to come in there with lights. So the jailer called for lights. So there's other prison guards there. And he ran to the dungeon and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and he asked them, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Okay, now this is what we're going to focus on next week. How did he know to ask that? How did he know what they had been doing? What did the little girl scream day after day after day? What are Paul and Silas here to do? They're here from the Most High God. And they are here to tell you what? How to be saved. 
Do you think this Roman soldier knew about salvation? Saved from what? He doesn't know. But did God prepare a way? He sure did, right? And it was a demon-possessed girl. So who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords? Who is in charge of it all? Who will bow down and worship Him? Even the demons. Because He's King of kings. And He is the ruler. And aren't you glad you're part of the kingdom of God? Amen. Thank you.